Hi everyone, today we're going to look at Turing NLG A17 billion parameter language model by Microsoft. The latest and greatest of language modeling by Microsoft. Um, <clears throat> what is this? It is a language model. A language model is basically a model that learns to produce language uh, given a language. So if you start a sentence, it's supposed to finish a sentence. If you start a paragraph, it's supposed to finish the paragraph. That's a language model. Um, ultimately, you can make it do different things like answer questions, have a conversation with you, anything to do with understanding language. The special thing about this one is that it's ginormous. So if you look at the scale of um, kind of language models, so BERT was quite a large thing in its back in its day. Uh, ye olde BERT, you can see here it has about 340 million parameters. Um, now, I have to say all of these language models are transformers. Uh, this is kind of the state of the art today. So all of these are, are kind of are transformer uh, based models. Um, then GPT-2 here, you can see that was the model that was so large, it was too dangerous to be released into the world. <laughs> um, that stands at 1.5 billion parameters. Megatron LM by NVIDIA, 8.3 billion. And now we are at 17 billion parameters for this language model. And <clears throat> it is a bit better. <laughs> so <laughs> like people just throw more and more and more resources at this language problem. And it really, yeah. So what you can do with it, you can of course, do language modeling. So what, what happens is you take a bunch of text like all of Wikipedia and all of the internet and all of Reddit and so on, and you let the model train on it um, to understand, to basically produce that sort of language. And then you can measure it, for example, it's, it's a perplexity on a validation set. And the Turing NLG is currently state of the art on that. Um, it can also do, for example, question answering. So you can ask it a question and give it a passage about that uh, question, and it will then tell you the answer that it deduced from that passage given the question, as you can see here. What is more interesting um, is that a usual QA system will point to the passage. So it will point to the words Tristan Prediman, um, whereas with a generative model like this one, what you can do is you can make it actually output an answer as a sentence. So it will generate the text, Jason Mraz was engaged to Tristan Pediman. Uh, sorry, Prediman. Um, <clears throat> if you ask a question without giving it a context, and just ask it to generate an answer, it will do so as well. I don't know if these answers are cherry picked, but they call this zero shot question answering. So if you ask when did World War II end, and it, it can output World War II ended in 1945, simply out of regularities it detected in the training data. So, I mean, that's what I'm kind of wondering. At what point are are these models, do they have so many parameters that they simply reproduce the, the training data, right? I mean, this clearly, some article from the training data is about World War II, or many are, and, and it simply learned that following a question, when did World War II end, it needs to answer with the appropriate passage. I'm not sure that is a... <laughs> proper measure of language understanding if you simply can bake more and more of the training data into these many, many parameters. But I'm not the, the judge of that here. <laughs> it can do it very well. So um, <clears throat> yeah, what I'm actually more interested in is this thing. It's called the zero optimizer that they use to train the model. So the model is just a transformer. It's just a big, big transformer model. There is nothing really special about the model uh, except that it is larger than the last model and therefore a bit better. 
Um, what is interesting is that this would have been pretty impossible to train if it weren't for this zero optimizer of this deep speed library. And Microsoft has released this deep speed library. It's compatible for now with PyTorch. You can check this out. I'll put a link into the description. And uh, we're, I, I want to dive into this a bit. So there's a paper. Uh, it's by Samyam Rajbandari and Al and by all by Microsoft. Uh, the paper describes uh, in detail the optimizer, but it's not very visual. That's why we're going to the blog post. <laughs> um, you can see it gives many speed ups over, over usual, over the previous Megatron LM model that NVIDIA just trained using kind of just what NVIDIA has is NVIDIA has machines that are interconnected within the machine with very fast um, very fast buses between GPUs but this zero optimizer can now also go over the network and make it pretty fast so let's explore that a bit I have copied this here so we'll, we'll look how the zero optimizer works so usually what you do is if you have multiple GPUs, you can do something like this. And this is called data parallelism. Um, what you have is you have a model and the model in this case fits on your GPU. It fits on a single GPU. So the blue thing here is the model. I'll actually draw this myself here. So the model, let's say, is a somehow a neural network, so it has a bunch of layers, layer, 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 right? And what you want to do is you pass data forward. Here is some loss, and then right into the loss function, and then backward again. That's basically what you, what you need to do. You need to pass it forward and backward in order to do backpropagation training, right? If this all fits into one box, that's completely fine. Right. If if this fits into one machine, cool. We can just put mini batches of data through batch one, batch two, batch three, and so on. Train the model. If you want to do a speed up using this, um, you can do so. If you have lots of data, you can do what's called. And I'm always confused. I think this is called data parallelism, or is it called model parallelism? Because in any case, what you can do is you can take a second machine, or many of those, replicate the model. Now, this, these models, these two models here, are exactly the same, right? But what you do is you take your data and you split it up. Basically, you take double the amount of data and you put one batch of data through the top part and you put the other through the bottom part. And you do your forward passes on the machines and you do your backward passes. And then what you want to do is you want to sync between the machines what they learned from the data. So each machine has a different set of data points. Um, each machine calculates its own up parameter updates. It learns from the data it has. And then it, they communicate uh, to keep because this here and this here should be the same, right? It's the same model. So they have to keep in sync. Now this can be usually can be done um, fairly efficiently, especially if these aren't actually two machines, but just two GPUs inside of one large machine. So if this is a large machine, this is GPU zero and this is GPU one. This is pretty standard because especially on NVIDIA machines, they have these, whatever, I think they call them InfiniBand or so, or is that? So NVIDIA has these connectors um, that connects the GPUs together really fast. Uh, so you can keep these in sync. But now the problem becomes, what if you want to train a model that is larger than this? So let's forget about the data parallelism for now, if that is what it's called, and just consider a model that is too large. So a model that is too large will not fit into a machine. So this is a model, as a large model. <laughs> so what you want to do is you want to pack some of the model onto your first machine and then 
take the other part of the model, sorry, and pack it onto another machine, right? You separate the model and put it on different machines. Now, if you have a batch of data, what you have to do is you pass it, pass it, pass it, forward propagate as you regularly would, but then you have an intermediate result. You send that to the next machine and you forward propagate that. At the end here, you have a loss, right? You wanna back propagate regularly through this machine. You have an intermediate result of back propagation, send it over the network and back prop all the way uh, through the model. So that's how you can train a model that is too large for one machine if you have multiple machines. The problem here, of course, is this part. Um, <clears throat> just as you had to keep in sync the model before, now your problem, your communication problem becomes um, one of, you have to send the intermediate stages to that model and you have to send the intermediate stage of the back propagation back to, to that part of the model. And while this part is um, working, this part is kind of idling away and the network overhead, sorry, is just very costly. Um, especially if your model is so large, you can't even fit into one of these single boxes, right? So um, this, this is very, um, this is very problematic here. <laughs> it's still doable. But what the zero optimizer does is it does both data and model parallelism. So it can train models that are too large, right? Too large for a single machine. Um, and it can do data parallelism at the same time such that basically everything is working all the time. There is no wasted or not much wasted computation. The communication is efficient and so on. So it's really a technical achievement. It's not so much an, a scientific advance. It's really a technical achievement, this optimizer. And we'll, we'll shortly go, go through. There is a kind of an animation, but it's in, on the website, but it's super slow. And I think this might be the first time that I will be faster at explaining something than a video. All right, <laughs> let's see here. All right. Cool, so what you do is, let's just consider these three GPUs. Before that, it would all fit on one machine, but now let's say you don't actually have that much, um, that much memory. You don't have these, these giant empty blocks here. <laughs> um, you just have a bit of that. So you have to split your model. The blue parts here are your model, right? These are, these are model parameters. The orange parts here is memory you need to uh, store gradients, right? You need as many gradients as you have model parameters as uh, because you do gradient descent. Um, the green stuff here are what's called optimizer parameters. Now, if you just have SGD, um, these would be non-existent. But if you have something like Adograd or Atom, they have additional parameters for each model parameter that they need to keep track of. So these are stored here and there can be significant overhead. Um, there's also like a, a floating point 3216 conversion going on here. Don't wanna go into that. All right, so you split your model onto these three machines. Let's say that's your entire model. Your model is six blocks wide, right? And you need to forward propagate now through everything. All right, so here is what zero does, and I think it's pretty cool. So what we need to do is we have these three different batches of data, and we want to forward propagate them all through the model, through the same model at the same time, as if the model were actually stored on all these machines, like if all of these machines had the entire model. Um, and we have can do a bit of communication. So what we do first is, uh, this one's easy, right? Data zero through the first two layers here is easy, right? Because we have them, right? So bang, you go through the first, you get an intermediate result here and here, right? Okay, how do we propagate um, data one through these 
through the first layer. We can't send data one here. That would be too expensive, right? And that's the whole point would be lost, right? Uh, we want to actually compute data one on this GPU at, at the same time. What we do is before we start, we actually communicate these two blocks here to GPU one, right? We, we send these parameters around and fill them in here. I should actually make them blue, right? Um, we send them here and we also send them here, right? We send the parameters to all the machines, right? Then we can actually forward prop data one through this and data three through this, right? So we can do forward prop. Um, after we've communicated, all the GPUs can be working. Same with layer two, right? So layer two <coughs> simply can send its it's um, these, these two here, you can see that these two here, uh, to the other machines, right? Now, while it's doing that, we've already propagated to, through the first layer. So we've already propagated here and here through the first layer. So we can actually delete these again, right? We can, we can delete these first layer parameters that we sent around again. Right. So here is how uh, you see how we can save memory. We don't keep all the model in sync on all the machines. We send whatever we need um, on the other machines. And then once the computation is done, they can delete it again, right? Because there's always one machine, right? This one here for the middle parameters that keeps track of the parameters and that can at any point, if they're needed, send them again. So that's the big kind of catch. So you can forward prop now through these two, right? They here, they're already present. And then you can delete those again on the machines where they're not natively stored. And you can send from here, you can send those two also up here, you can send those two and, um, and forward prop your model through to the end, right? Da -da, da -da. Oops. Yeah, that was a mistake. They should be here. Then each machine calculates its own loss, right? Loss, loss, loss. And the backward propagation happens in much the same way. So as you can, if you, if you follow it so far, you can already imagine, right? Um, what I can do is, so now this is a loss. The loss is different because there's a different batch of data going through each machine. Right? So there's a different batch of data going through each machine, but each machine has computed with the same model due to the communication um, of the zero optimizer. So that's pretty cool. So you get the benefits of data parallelism, right? Lots of data on the different machines, and you also split up the model across the machines. But the um, you don't actually store the model on any of these machines. You don't store the model. You only send, right? From here you send as you need, and then you delete again, right? And for the backward propagation, same thing, right? You do backward propagation, you calculate gradients. Now you calculate gradients here, and you send the gradients as needed to the other machines, right? You calculate gradients here and here, and you send them to the machine where they're actually needed. This is a weird pen, sorry. <laughs> you send them to that machine, that machine will aggregate all the gradients of all the machines. What is up with this pen? Okay. Um, it will aggregate them and then locally, it can compute using these optimizer parameters and so on. It can do all kinds of optimization locally because it has gathered gradients from all the other data. So what you end up with, for example, GPU two here for these two layers, it has effectively broadcast the layers such that much, much more data than it just had itself could run through the layers. It has aggregated gradients from all of that data. And now it can use all of these gradients together to make a good update um, using the optimizer parameters to make a good update to these uh, model parameters.
And then in the next iteration, it can go ahead and broadcast the model parameters, the new model parameters again. So it is able to compute with much more data than it can just fit by itself. Um, and it is just doing its part. So zero and deep speed, uh, so zero is the, the, I guess the protocol and deep speed is the actual library. They will do all of this communication and splitting and so on for you over the network in a way that is efficient, in a way that everything runs at the same time and um, the communication overhead is minimal. And you can actually choose which stage uh, you want, so what your trade-off of communication and memory saving will be. So this is extremely cool. They say this goes up to whatever, 100 billion parameter models. Um, if you use, I don't, <laughs> this isn't something for you know, your average Colab user. Um, this is really something for the, for big players. But that being said, I don't think language is solved by simply throwing more parameters at it. I think we're, that we're still a bit of a breakthrough. Uh, there's still a big, big of a breakthrough ahead <clears throat> yet to come uh, in language understanding with newer model architectures. All right, that was it for me. Thanks.